Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Again, it's good to be able to join you today as we open up another portion of God's Word. In 2 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 33, we find one of the saddest statements in the Bible. There we find these words, Then the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place, O Absalom, my son, my son. These are the words of David. David was one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. Of course, Absalom was his son. Absalom had just been killed, and of course, David is mourning for his son. Now, the idea of a parent mourning over his child, of course, is nothing new. Most all of us would uh, mourn over a child that we lost, and many, many parents have done just exactly that. But in order for us to understand this statement and understand David's grief, then we need to go back and look at the whole situation, look at the whole story. Now, we don't have time to look at the, in detail the story. Let's just briefly uh, deal with the details. Of course, you remember David had a number of different wives, had several children by different women, and so they had many half-sisters and half-brothers. And sometimes they did not get along very well. One time we find that one brother uh, ha- raped his half-sister, and of course that caused many problems, and that's the background. In chapter 15 of 2 Samuel, we find that Absalom begins to rebel against David. Undoubtedly, part of it would be due to what's been going on in the past. It says in that chapter that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. In other words, he went around kissing all the babies and promising to give every man justice. He promised to be more sensitive to their needs than what David had been. We never read about Absalom's wisdom or his virtue. Every time Absalom is mentioned, it is in a negative sense. You see, the most ambitious person is many times the least qualified, and that seems to be the case with Absalom. Eventually, because he wins the hearts of the people, he became the ruler over part of Israel. A battle was now necessary because... uh, Absalom was rebelling against David. He was winning the hearts of the people. And so some of the people wanted Absalom to be the king, but of course David was the real king. He was the one that God had anointed to be king. And in chapter 16 then, we find that David begins to get on the run from Absalom. Absalom goes into David's concubines, and and this was a sign of victory for the conqueror. At that point, it looked like Absalom was going to be the new king. But then in chapter 18, Absalom leads his forces in battle against David's army. By now, David's army had been had time to prepare. And David's government, of course, was based on the divine promise. And so Absalom was really fighting against God himself. David's forces were superior to Absalom's army. And he slaughtered Absalom's army, and of course, Absalom himself was killed in battle. David then grieves for Absalom. As was said before, this is not unusual. For a parent to be grieving for a child would not be unusual at all. But what we find here is a cry of retribution. Part of the cry was the consciousness that God was now punishing David for the sins that he had committed. God had already promised David he was going to punish him, and David certainly was uh, was being punished at this time. 
We also see in this cry a cry of grief over a wasted life. Absalom apparently was a very gifted man. He was blessed with the love of a great man. He, Sir David certainly loved his son Absalom. Apparently Absalom had many attractive qualities that won the allegiance of the common man. For instance, in chapter 14 and verse 25, we read of his beauty. Uh, he had nothing to complain about as far as beauty was concerned. He was a very handsome man. And we might say today he could have been the poster child for any modeling agency. And there's nothing wrong with being handsome or beautiful from a physical appearance. But instead of using his body as a living sacrifice for God, he used it as bait to attract attention. Indeed, Absalom should have counted for something great and good in this world. He had all the advantages, but he was buried like a dead dog in a pit with a pile of stones heaped over him. Absalom had undoubtedly thought he would one day lie in a costly tomb as a king, which he had built for himself. But that did not happen. You know, Jesus said that all who exalt themselves would be humbled. Well, certainly Absalom was certainly humbled. Now, why did Absalom come to a place such as this? Why did he not achieve more in his life? As I said, he had all the advantages. His father was a king. He had great natural physical abilities and beauty and attractiveness. It seemed to have, I'm sure he had a good education. It seemed to have everything going for him, and yet he accomplished nothing. Why did such a waste come about? Well, there might be several reasons, but let's notice at least two or three. One reason was because David failed to train. David failed to train his children. He failed to a large extent as a parent. In Psalm 127, in verse 3, it is stated that children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. It's given to all parents as a blessing from God, but it's the responsibility of parents to train their children in the way that they should go. Proverbs 22 in verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Well, David failed as a father. He failed to discipline his children. Now, we need to point out that that's not necessarily the only reason. Sometimes you may train right and still the children will not grow up right. And we'll mention the reason why in just a moment for that. But in this case, I think one large reason for Absalom's excuse or failure was David's failure as a parent. He failed to discipline his children. He failed to punish them when they sinned and rebelled against God. But not only did David fail as a parent, he also failed in his marriages. David was a polygamist. He had many wives. As Jesus said in Matthew 19, that is certainly not what God wanted. God wanted one man for one woman, and yet David did not listen to that. And he major problems arose, at least partly due to his marriage decisions. And that led to a lot of problems with his children because they had different parents. Might have had the same father, but they had different mothers. And that brought up a lot of problems. You see, our children are watching us. David's children saw in David a man of war. It said in the Bible that David was a man of war. Even God said David was a man of war. Maybe Absalom saw that the way to solve problems or to get what you want was through fighting for it. And so Absalom wanted to be king, and he was willing to fight against his own father in order to be king. What are your children seeing in your home? Are they seeing you as a faithful parent, as a faithful servant of God, and your home as being a Christian home? Or are they seeing you that while you claim to be a servant of God, you claim to be a Christian, in actuality, you're serving yourself as much as you're trying to serve God? 
You see, many times that's the problem. We parents say one thing, but we live according to another belief. But as we said before, all the blame cannot be laid at the feet of David. Even if you train up a child in the way he should go, they're not necessarily going to listen because every child makes his own decision about how he's going to live his life. We've all seen cases where you have two children in the same home, both brought up with the same parents, with the same background, the same training, but yet they go in opposite directions, morally and religiously. So you see, it's not all about necessarily what the parents teach and live, but the children choose. Why do we choose? Why do children choose to do the wrong thing? Well, again, there's probably several reasons. One reason certainly is peer pressure. It's a great temptation to be just like everyone else. In Exodus 23 and verse 2, we find this statement that you shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Indeed, many people want to do what everybody else is doing. That is the great excuse in our society today is why everyone else is doing it. But it may, it may be true that most other people are doing it, but that doesn't mean it's right. Our schools is one of the big problems. Most children think that if the school does it and the teacher says it, then it must be right. Uh, but that's not necessarily true either. But regardless of the reasons why our children make wrong decisions, many times they do, they make wrong decisions. And undoubtedly, that was the part of the problem with Absalom. He made the wrong decision. But it's a great waste and a tragedy. A man of obvious ability and talent, but yet he was also proud, deceptive, malicious, a murderer, and a liar. Think of all the pain and anguish Absalom brought upon the house of David and the nation of Israel. But David wanted to take Absalom's place. He loved Absalom so much that he wanted to take his place, but of course he could not do that. No man can become the substitute of another person before God. No one can take another's guilt or another's punishment. Everyone must be judged according to what he has done in his own life. But there is one great exception to that, and that is the cross upon which Christ died for sinners. You see, no matter how many blunders or mistakes or how big those mistakes might have been, no matter what the guilt is, no matter the rest of retribution, there was one who was permitted to take your place, and that is Jesus himself. David cried out, Would God I had died for thee. Well, in Christ, that is changed into a grand declaration of hope. Christ declares, I have died for you. I have redeemed you with an everlasting love. Indeed, Christ did die for us. He wants to save each and every one of us from the things that we have committed in our lives. We are just like David in many cases. We have committed great, great sins ourselves. Would you be willing to accept the great sacrifice that Christ died for us? Are you willing to become obedient to the will of God? Become obedient in faith to what Christ, and the words of Christ. You know, if we do that, then God has promised to forgive us of all our sins. And we do not have to suffer the consequences of our sins as Absalom had to suffer and as David had to suffer for those sins. We can escape the great condemnation that we all deserve simply because we respond in faith to the commandments of Christ. You know, Christ has promised to do that for us. He died just for us so that we might escape. Now it's left up to you. It's left up to me. 
if we're doomed to eternity in hell, then it's not God's fault. It's not Christ's fault. God loved us so much that he did send his, Christ, his son, but he doesn't love us so much that he's going to overlook and ignore the sins that's in our life. God is also a God of justice. Sin will be punished. And sin has been punished in the death of Jesus Christ. And Christ has promised to take our place if we only respond in faith. I hope that you will do that. If you haven't done that, then do that today. And again, if you need more information, would like to talk to someone about further Bible study and how to respond in Christ, then certainly give us a call. And someone will be more than happy to study with you and answer all your questions so that you can respond in faith. And then when this life is over, then you will not have to suffer the consequences for your sins, but you will enjoy the great blessing that God had prepared for his children. Thank you for your attention today. It is God's will that you must be saved. First, listen to the Bible truth. And you must believe the truth. Then you must repent from your sinful life. Then you must confess by words that the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Every day our Lord added those who were being saved into his church. Be blessed by studying the word of God. To receive the Voice of Truth International Magazine and to study the Bible systematically through our English Bible Correspondent Course, kindly write to us. Our address, Gracious Word, P.O. Box 15. Our study Madurai 625016 Tamil Nadu. For more details, dial 9244204420. 9244214421. God bless you. The Church of Christ salutes you.